Just a unique identifier, that's something I learnt later on about better ways to do those things. I uh, thought about the, the status of the cat, I thought that might be useful. Because there used to be a cat called Freya, which Alistair Darling's cat when he was the Chancellor in 11 Downing Street. That's inactive now. I couldn't find out if it was actually dead or not, so it's just inactive. It could be sleeping somewhere <laughs> down the back of a sofa, we're not quite sure. I thought I needed a bit of evidence, because you know, I'm a data person. So I needed a bit of evidence. I thought I'd get somewhere where I've learned about this cat from. I can't just write in the cats I've heard of around government or spot a cat down, down in Whitehall. So I just published that list and it made me quite happy. And so I just put it there, it took me a few minutes. I did it using a tool called Octopub, which is built by the ODA Labs team. So Sam over there, one of the team who helped build, build that. Build that tool, it's open source. Basically, I just wrote up a little spreadsheet of data in Google Sheets. I sent that, I downloaded it to CSV, put it up into Octopub. Octopub created all the front end for me, it made it all proper. It gave me an open data certificate. It meant people could use the data to some extent if they really wanted to use a list of government cats. And it took me about 15 minutes. So I just did that and I thought, that's great. I put it on Twitter, said GovCats on Twitter, and then I went back to my evidence. I got some messages quite quickly though, because I told people about my data by putting it on Twitter. Some people came in and said, uh, yeah, your list is incomplete, I found another one. And somebody else came in with another list, actually, they found another web page full of cats. A guy called Owen Boswava. And he helped me find, actually find this cat called Nemo, <laughs> which is great. So we found Nemo, it's actually, it used to be Howard Wilson's cat when Howard Wilson was Prime Minister, with the white heat of technology there with his pipe. Bit list there, you can find out lots more about those cats. And Nemo is actually his personal cat, he took it into the civil service. You know, so it's almost like a political appointee he made that, so I'm going to grab that person, <laughs> bring them into my office, get them to work. The, we also found some other cats, a bit close to me, lots of cats called Peter, which is kind of spooky. The, and luckily, you know, there's actually three male cats called Peter, some of the earliest cats. Uh, Petra as well, <coughs> female cat later on, which is good, bit of diversity, we wanted some of those things, I like that. So that made me quite happy. Obviously, people accused me of making up that, so again, I had to evidence it and say that came from somewhere. Otherwise, people were just saying I was being silly and making up data. It's not the kind of thing I'd normally do. The, obviously, there were issues about date standards, because I just typed in dates willy-nilly. Could you know, I was thinking about myself. And somebody came along, actually, that's Stuart from the ODI Labs team, who was uh, <coughs> quite keen for me to put it into the uh, proper date standard. So he did an update for me, which is great. So he actually just, because the data was on GitHub, he just said, I'll change that and fix it for you, which is very nice of him. So he corrected all that for me, got it working. That was great. And it was this little thing that you get, and you see it sometimes when people are publishing data. People can see you publishing data and you get worried. Are they telling me off? Are they shouting at me? Are they saying this data is not perfect? And you get a bit nervous, and sometimes it can stop your publishing data. The, but actually, these people were actually helping. No, no, little way. Some of them actually were a little bit confrontational with me on Twitter. I was get, there was a big row on Twitter about date standards and what date standards should be being used and how it should be formatted. I went to the pub and that was going on. It just carried on in my timeline. But you know, but it was a thing that actually those people, they were just users or potential users of the data, just trying to say, how can I make it better? So it's one of those nice things you get with open data, especially when you do it collaboratively. People can help you out. And they were doing. And that's good. But then we're thinking, you know, I've got a list of data, I need to do something with it, you know? No one had really, strangely enough, the papers hadn't picked up on it and started referring their stories about these cats back to a, an authoritative data source. That may be very, quite unusual. I thought, I've got to build something with this, get a few more. So the labs team as well, they built a tool called Botham. The Botham brings you information. That's what it does, it's a way of storing metrics on the web so you can gather stats and you can use that then to drive into other things like dashboards or reports and things like that. Again, it's a free open source tool you can do and they thought this is great, we can get Peter using this as well and he can tell us if it's working or if he can work out how to use it. So I thought fine, I'll throw myself at that, see what I can do over a weekend. The Botham's built on top of a, a tool called Heroku, it's a platform as a service tool, makes it really easy to do things. I found out I only had to log into that once, I didn't really even have to look at that. Botham just obfuscated it all away from me, really easy for me to use. Made it simple for me to build up these metrics. But yeah, but there's some pictures if people want to see it. The, but what I need to do is get data from that register 
into Boston. So if I wanted to have a count of cats in the register, I needed to do something to do that. So it's what, you know, the classic if this, then that type scenario. But it's a nice cloud-based tool for that now called Zapier, which we've been playing around with a bit here. You now it's free to try out at a simple level. So I just use Zapier to hook these things together. And what Zapier lets you do is just hook together various different types of applications. You can use it to send an email or fill out a spreadsheet. And in my case, I just wanted just to grab some data, so to look at that GitHub repository, grab some data and push it into Botham. That's fine. I had to get, so I get thought, cool, I'll go to grips with that as well. I mean, I used to be used to do a bit of coding. I haven't done quite a bit for a while. I've mostly been writing blogs and going around saying silly things about cats for a while now. So I had to look at Python. The last time I was looking at scripting languages, it was Perl and expect and tickle for those who go back a little way on some of these things. And I found Python really, really powerful. <laughs> nice little cartoon here about XKCD about how, quite how powerful it is. The, but that kind of was making it a bit tricky. You know, I was kind of lost in a bit. I was like lost in a forest of thicket of stuff. How can I make this thing work? How can I get my data out? How can I write a bit of Python code that will grab data from GitHub, do some monging on it, add up some numbers, and then push it into another place? But I wasn't alone in dealing with that. So I could just go around and I could say, cool, somebody on Twitter, who can help me? Somebody on our Slack channels, how to make Python do what I want. That's the kind of way I talk on Slack channels. Please help me, do things for me now. Or just go into Google or DuckDuckGo, your favorite tool, whatever it may be. Because lots of these things, again, I mean, lots of people know that, but it wasn't really that hard. I just said, I want to do this. And I found somebody else had already done lots of it for me. And I could copy and bring things together and just with being out, know, not being too scared about it. I could make things happen. But I wanted to get some of my stats. One of the things I wanted to do was work out what percentage of cats in the UK were actually employed by UK government. I thought that'd be interesting. Someone's going to must need to know that data. So I asked Google how many cats are in the UK. And it told me there's 8.5 million dogs, 7.4 million cats from the RSPCA. It's wrong. So Google's actually giving you the wrong results. The, if you look actually dive into data.gov.uk, so I, I started using that because I thought, oh, I'm lazy, I'll just grab the data from Google. If you dive into data.gov.uk, there's actually the, I can't which, what the name of the organisation is now, but it's a health research centre, it's part of the, it's actually part of the DEFRA group of agencies. They actually publish some data on the estimated number of cats and dogs per postcode area in the UK. It's estimated, so it's still say things like 0.65 of a cat in this region. I'm not sure if it's caught on a boundary, but hopefully it is just estimations and stats they're using. The, so I could actually, what I could actually do again with Python was just grab that data, add up the number, and automate that to come into a dashboard. So it's all, the data's just down the web. But I did have that little lesson there that the, the search engines don't always find us the right data. You know, you have to do a bit more work now. That's something we've been thinking about quite a bit actually as well. Actually, two of the students, two PhD students, we got happy, Lara and Amelia in the office looking at how we can actually find, make it easier to discover good data on the web. It's one of those things, again, that we all worry about, but I suppose with election results and facts and all those things we're debating now, it's because people can't actually always get to the right answer, or they get to an answer. Is that the right answer? Is that the answer I want for my problem? I wanted a more accurate answer than the RSPCA. So I ended up with two zaps. So I just grabbed a zap, no, a zap, which just ran some Python. Anytime GitHub was triggered, Anytime there's a commit into my data repository, it grabs some numbers, like the total number of cats and various things. And another one, which anytime actually runs every month, and it goes away and looks at the official government statistics for cats, and counts up the number of cats in Whitehall, SW1 postcode, and number of cats across the whole UK, and automates it. I can't show you the code, unfortunately. Zapier's got some limitations. So on that GitHub, where people go in and contribute to the code and help fix it, or change it, or improve it, or copy it, Zapier is a bit harder to do that with. You know, it's a more of a closed platform. Bit of a gap there. But again, we're thinking of the dashboard. You know, I was thinking there's never enough cats on the web. Mm -hmm. I suppose there's millions of cats, billions of cats on the web already. But you know, there's not that many in the web of data. I only had about 14, 15 at this point. So I was thinking, how can I get a few more, a bit more data, <coughs> so we can get all of these cats and kittens. Uh, also, so the thing what I used was this thing of uncertainty. 
to say, actually, there's some bits of data I don't know much about. You know, I don't know if a cat's alive or dead, just like Mr. Schrodinger and his box. You know, maybe people can help you find out more evidence about those cats. So I was trying to think with the, with the dashboards, I built it up. How can I incentivize behavior? And kind of what I was thinking about was how can I get more people to give me more data about cats? Because that would fill my whimsy and help me think about my thoughts or whatever I was doing. So whenever a cat was inactive, like Freya, Alice Darling's cat, you know, is it really inactive or is it doing something else? Or some of those Peters, there's not evidence as to that the Peter actually died, someone just retired. They could still be hanging around somewhere. Lots of civil servants hanging around in retirement. But this ended up with a cat dashboard, which is there on the web. So that was quite fun. Didn't take me that long to do. Probably in total about four, five, six hours effort. You know, just working out these things, working out how to do it. I say lots of things I hadn't done before, just asking questions, annoying other people, lots of people helping out. Again, look that lovely thing about being open, all of this code again, it's on GitHub, is if it breaks, somebody help you fix it. So last night when I was finishing off some of the slides for this talk, I saw the dashboard was broken. This morning when I got into the office and was trying to carve out some time to fix it, somebody had sent me a pull request on GitHub to say, I fixed that dashboard. Here you go, I fixed it for you. I know you're doing a talk today. I might even be in the audience and I want the dashboard to be working. So they just sent me a pull request this morning. That's fine, I fixed it. Because again, we could work together. The joy of open. So, but there is this thing of people, for some reason people do keep saying to me, but Peter, you're not just doing it for a joke, are you? This, sometimes there is more going on in your mind than just terrible puns. And sometimes it's true there is more in my mind than terrible puns. Not that much more, but a little bit more. <coughs> you know, what am I going to use this cat dashboard for, this cat register and dashboard for? You know, we talk about data being used for transparency, accountability, public services, business innovation. Is anyone actually going to use this thing? You know, is it going to help out with journalism? Is it just going to be a teaching tool? So one of the things we tried a little bit, we sent it around a, a few, sent it around a few embassies actually, saying, have you got cats? And do you want to do it? Uh, the DEFRA team, again, we're looking, can they use this to help people understand how easy it is to maintain open data and look at open data? So use it as a bit of an engagement or a learning thing. The, I'm not sure it does much business innovation. I couldn't, I'm struggling a bit with that one. Possibly a bit on accountability. I mean, cost of cats. You know, should we be paying for cat food at these troubled times? The, but unfortunately, the government is actually, the civil servants are actually paying for these cats out of their own pockets, is what you can find when you do ask a few questions, read a few reports, which actually is different to what it used to be. Uh, the father of a friend of mine popped up on Facebook to say he used to look after the cats for the southwestern region of the post office. And it was his job to pay money out every month to post offices and branches based on how many cats they had. <laughs> <coughs> he drew me various pictures of these cats. Unfortunately, they're lost in Facebook somewhere. Uh, so at some point, I might try and get him to tell his story of looking after a different kind of government cat back in the 60s, 70s. The, that could be interesting. But there's another thing as well that the, you know, we talk a lot at the ODI about the web of data. You know, so we talk about this thing of that we're building this web of data alongside the web of documents that we're all used to and that's been being built. And to some extent, this web of cats was helping me just play around with a few things and a few concepts around that just by playing with some nice, easy stuff. Because you know, web of data can be hard to understand. You know, when we go to events, we throw up slides like this, really busy slides, and deliberately busy slides, because we're trying to say to people, this is quite big. The, that actually, you know, people talk about the amount of data collected in the, in the next last two or three years, and it's quite scary. When you hear some of those stats, people talk about billions of records, I don't know, don't care. But it's even more devices and things coming online all the time, collecting more and more data about us, and that's changing lots of stuff. You know, it changes the economics of data. So data is actually becoming a change the economics. Data is becoming a commodity. It's so much easier to collect data now. As I was seeing with my cat data, it's really easy to publish data and get it out there. It's a lot easier than some people think. A lot of people put up barriers, but actually, these things aren't that hard. You know, we talk about we live in an age of data abundance because of that. A lot of things we're doing is actually trying to work out what that means. 
because no one really knows what it means to live in that world and change those things. How's it going to change our society? You know, it could be just like heaven. It could be all happy cats in that future world, or it could be quite scared and dark and worried about what's going to happen in that future where there's lots of data flowing around. You know, it's something we need to challenge and debate about. You know, and one of the things we say about this as well is you've got to be fearless, be a bit open to kind of explore that. And again, that's one of the things I was trying to do just by publishing that data out there and then seeing who came back to me and all the corrections they made and all the ways they told me I'd misspelled the word, the word license, which I'm sure I did in some of the early bits of work. The, and again, so when you're going into these new spaces, so we're looking at that changing world, we often don't know what it really means. You have to explore, experiment, learn by doing. You know, I can be, if I'm sitting there writing a blog, it's better if I'm writing a blog about data policy, not based just on talking with the team, which I'm always doing, chatting with our team, and our team's working on lots of projects here. But if I've got my hands a bit dirty as well, and played with some of these things, done more of it myself, so we like to always like to do those things, but it's informed by delivery. These things need to work together. The... There's personal data, and I'm really sorry about that one. The, it's not quite the worst pun, but it's close to it. Because, again, one of the things that came out afterwards was some people said, actually, are you a, is there a personal data issue here? Am I damaging cat privacy and safety? Now, these are <coughs> Larry and Palmerston, two cats from Number 10 and Downing Street, uh, some foreign office fighting. Because I actually went to somebody at the foreign office and said, I was thinking, again, thinking, how can I make, take this a bit further and see what I can explore? I said, can I put a tracker on a cat? I said, and I, I said maybe it's national security issue. They said, no, no, we're a bit more, more worried that Larry the Downing Street cat is going to know where Palmerston is and they're going to end up in another fight because these cats might know about each other and do some things. So you get into it, no, think of those things. So I didn't do a privacy impact assessment when I published that data. But, you know, but it's one of those things that other people will be thinking about as they're doing it. So for me, it's quite easy, but for other types of data, it would be a bit harder. The, you know, so I might end up with something like that when I'm thinking about it. Current cat location should be protected. But the cat job, that should be open data. Yeah, that's not harmful. You know, we can use these tools for serious purposes. And accuracy as well. So that's another little thing which certainly came out in this. The, so I was just writing down where these cats are working. You know, I just thought, I'm just going to write down things, 10 Downing Street, 11 Downing Street, and do my usual thing of how do I keep this data looking the same. I'm going to copy and paste it from field to field, because that's what we do. You know, but is that really accurate? And if I look on gov.uk, and I look for a list of government departments, you know, I get different names for those things that are going on. If I look on Wikipedia, actually, there's a list of national government buildings in London on Wikipedia, which someone's maintaining. You know? And should that be been my authoritative list? Should I have been linking over here and saying this is a good source of that data to make sure I'm right? Now, especially if somebody might just go in and just, it's Wikipedia, someone might just go in and add a rogue entry as another reference to a cure song. The, or it could be that, again, I'm only, all I was doing was looking at Whitehall and government cats. There's lots of, lots of government buildings and places outside of London, you know? Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales all over the place, and this is just actually UK government, central government buildings, if I was to go local authority, if I was to go other bits of the public sector, there's lots more out there, maybe that's actually what we should have been looking at. Now, words are being a bit London-centric by talking about Whitehall cats. I did ask Devon Council if they had any cats, because I know some people there. The, and they were thinking about, should they go to their councillors and get the councillors' cats? Because lots of their councillors have got cats, apparently. And again, there you start to get into issues of Actually, I'm talking about government cats, but actually we live in a mixed economy. You know, lots of our services are being delivered by the public sector and the private sector and all these different bits and pieces. So really, I was just being very, very limited by thinking just of those few buildings in Whitehall. But actually, all of these bits are working on all that data could be important to come out there. The, so this is a, a picture actually of Paul Downey, who's the... Uh, the lead architect for the government's data program, their register work in cabinet office. You know, that people often see government as just being, it's interesting you have the cat already on the picture, <laughs> as one cat sitting outside 10 Downing Street. 
but actually government and the state and society, you know, is this mishmash of things. It's buildings, it's people, it's fields, it's safety on the streets. Actually, it's a far more complex thing than people often think. So when I said government cats, and nobody actually came back to me and said, Peter, that's not government. You know, no one actually came back to me with that pushback. But really, the real world is a lot more complex sometimes. We can start off simple, and we can start small and start to iterate towards it. But really, it's often a lot more complex. But those are some of the things that was helping me think about. Because it wasn't just about being bored on a Friday afternoon and publishing a few bits of cats on the web, although it may have started like that. But anyway, that was my talk. And there we go, and I'm doing no more work on it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. That was um, really informative <laughs> and really interesting. Um, I've got, so we've got some time for questions now. I've got one to kick us off. Uh, you talked about what you've learned in creating this register, and you've talked a bit about the awareness raised in certain departments and people in government when you've talked to them about cats, essentially. Do you think that we need to think about other kind of Trojan cats, Trojan <laughs> horses, um, in engaging government with data? Yes. Opening data. The, it's, it's, making, it's often making these topics accessible to people. So often you know, we've got this habit of, in the data community, we have our language, we have our things, we have our, you know, our special things we talk about. I might go into a room and say, PATH, where's my PATH file? I want the PATH file. People don't know that history. So often it's a way of engaging them with a real problem, such as how many government cats they have, or a real problem or something which actually grasps them a bit more, a bit more emotional maybe as well. Has anyone got any questions that they'd like to ask? Can I ask a question about language? Yes. Um, what's a register? A register, so Paul Downey's going to talk a bit about this next week. The, and he may even challenge whether the cat register is actually a register. So a government would say a register, the government definition is that a register is an authoritative list that you can trust. That's the really short sentence for a register. So it's an authoritative source of data published by government. Other people might say that there's an authoritative list of data published by private sector and companies or civil society and charities. But it's just an authoritative list of data you can trust, published on the web. It doesn't always have to be open. Some registers will be open so anyone can see it. Some will be registers that you can ask questions of. So it might be you could ask a question of a, a proper cat register saying, is Larry the Downing Street cat at home today? And that might be reasonable information to receive from a register, which isn't privacy invasive. Does that help? What's the difference between a register and a cat along? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> One is more pun worthy than the other, I believe is the correct is the correct answer. So, and the question that I have is relating, because I'm working with um, different data sets of Company House back in Portugal. Yep. And I have six that are a lot of um, public records of companies. And I have problems with merging or data fusion. So if you, what were the, the ways that you figure out which is the correct source? Uh, how do you do missing values when you have so many sparse information across? Because I'm trying to get information for company house, to company records for participations of companies, and do a network graph where people invest in venture capital, for instance. Cool. So I'm looking for a lot of public yep. that I know is true, because yep. if it's in increasing share capital, it's there. But then I have, for instance, crunch base. So not all things are record. So I have. To, so how do you work out with this kind of? Uh, I'm going to try to get different pieces and do the whole map. Yeah. The, so there's a few different things there. So one is different types of data have different levels of confidence in their provenance. So it's something we, I've looked at quite a bit in some other things. Of, for example, the, so the sheer existence of a company and who is who, that a company is registered or tax registered, that's something the state, you know, a government is the best source for that data. It can be sourced from elsewhere, but it's going to be a lower level of confidence. Often I've worked in things where we've taken in data sets from multiple places and then weighted the data according to those different places it's come from. So if it's come from government, 100%. If it's come from here, 80%. Come from here, 60%. In terms of the missing values, I'm, especially if this data is going to be open afterwards, I, the trick I used on this was I actually published it with some missing values and then people helped me fill them in. 
So I had some gaps and bits and pieces saying, I can't find a link for this, I can't find a link for that. And people just started saying, oh, I've found you something. So again, just starting to say, there's other people out there who want to solve, who want the same data. How do I get to them? And then use them to help fill in those missing gaps. Because right? data, again, they come with this misconception that data needs to be perfect before it's published. It just needs to be good enough for you to start using it, and then you can start improving it through use. Right. Is that Great. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, please, uh, quick, I think the mic doesn't work, is it? No. Um, just, it's like holding the conch, is it, sort of thing. Um, <laughs> have you found any data relating to uh, cats in government departments and work efficiency? So, for example, <laughs> do they make the uh, staff more relaxed and so on? Or are there cat deletion records when they're walking across the keyboards and hit the delete button by accident? That sort of thing. I haven't put... Actually, there is some data out there from the civil service survey yeah. that we could correlate against it. The which will be interesting. I did so we did at one point produce several stats actually on cat diversity and the underrepresented nature of cats in government departments. You know, there's only I think it's currently there's only three of the central government departments which have cats, which is quite disgraceful. You know, they're very they're very underrepresented as far as other strict they're very represented as other things. But that correlation would be possible. I could have a look at that. I'll bring that in from the civil service survey, which I know where to get hold of. In particular, government crunch on that. Cool, thank you. Hannah, have we got any questions on Twitter? No. Okay, one more. Can I, can I follow up on the definition of authoritative lists that you can yeah. trust? I mean, let's say that's true, but. What makes your thing either authoritative or means that I can trust it? Ab my follow up question. Absolutely. So that is one where my list was not authoritative. My list should not be trusted. I'm not the person, unless I have a good community around that register, or I'm in the chain where I'm notified when a cat enters government service or exits government service, I couldn't be. So it was very clear on this one, again, that I wasn't the authoritative source. My list of cats should not be trusted, the, which is a sad thing for me to admit, but I, in the deep, dark night, I occasionally admit it. The, and I worry about was I wasting my time. But the, you know, I worry about it. I, I don't think it's true. But, the, but there's a way of, of saying that, that actually there's for very, very, I do need very, very highly trusted data of putting something in the chain like that, where it's somebody in the, the loop where they know that it's being interdicted. Then you get into how do other people know that person is in the chain? How do I know? How do I trust that that person is who they say they are and they are at that point in the process? But that's always the question of trust. Trust is a very hard thing. Blockchain will solve it. I'm supposed to say that as well, I think, at this point. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Um, doesn't that open up a question, though, that the only data that we can trust is official data? At what point does an individual producing data actually, because of what they have done and how it can be um, checked, actually allow it to be trusted data? I would trust your data. It yeah. may be incomplete. But I trust you um, in terms of what you have done, so I would trust your data. So there's, I think there's a thing there around literacy of <coughs> how do I know enough to know when to trust somebody else and their data. The, cause there is this, again, the kind of conception of is it black or white, it's zero or one, this data is good or it is bad. Pretty much all data has some uncertainty in it. The, and it's often, again, the data experts and the people in the community, they know that's going to be reasonable enough for my purposes, so I trust it enough. They're prepared to accept that gap. Other people get very discombobulated when they realise it's there. So one of the things we did actually last year, I think it was, <coughs> we're looking at UK address lists, and we realised that the list of UK addresses has more uncertainty than people think, because there are demolished buildings recognise as official addresses because nobody has seen that the building has gone because since the last update. So we actually did a bit of work to look at the half-life of a UK address and the half-life of a UK address since 
just before World War II is about 25 years. So there's a, only a 50% chance if you leave a building and in 25 years you come back to the same spot that that building and address is still there. But obviously that includes World War II, which would have changed some factors. But all data has a level of uncertainty. And I think there's a literacy thing about some of us choose to trust it, some of us say that's not the perfect. And that's the level of confidence you want in data but also changes according to what you want to do with that data. So some people want very high trust for use they're using, other people are comfortable with lower trust and a list of cats published on the web. That's a great answer. Um, about uh, data literacy. I was going to pick you up earlier on a, a tangential point to ask really why you trust a government veterinary agency more than the RSPCA about the total number of cats in the UK. The, I drilled a bit. I couldn't find any reports on the RSPCA, which would give me good confidence in their numbers. The, I could drill back through... I could drill back a bit through the health... whichever agency it was. I can't remember the name, but I watched H something something. The, as to where they produce their things, so I could see something. There's possibly, it's a fair challenge. If I challenge myself, it's possibly because I know some of the DEFRA team. So there may be a little bit there of actually a personal link. I know some of them, therefore I'm more likely to trust them. I don't know anybody who currently works for the RSPCA. So there may be something actually like that in my head. That's interesting. That's Any other questions? No? Okay. Oh, one more. Just uh, to have uh, an idea, how, mu how much of this data was in what I call dumb PDF files? Because most of with feedback I have in Lisbon, I said that publishing data is not putting the PDF of the final contract or the putting the financial tables if it's uh, like I have PDFs of tables that are yeah. useless and I have to take them back. How much of the, that data you have, it's machine readable? Because of government, I have PDFs, so. Got it. So all of the cat data, so the data actually about individual cats, that was all just handcrafted. It was taken out of Wikipedia, news reports, uh, Twitter reports, some diplomatic embassy blogs. So some of the embassies have actually po uh, blogged about their cats. It was just grabbed off their blogs by some ex-diplomats in my Facebook feed who thought it would, they would maybe understand what Peter's talking about over dinner. The, uh, the data about the number of cats in the country, that was machine readable, it was scruffy. So it actually switched formats part way through. Some of the data was actually, some of the data was clearly native numbers, some of the data had clearly come out of probably Excel or something because had quote marks and commas as separators. So that all needed a bit of cleansing on that data, but it was trying to be machine readable and it wasn't too hard to clean with a bit of help. Actually, it's one thing that on PDF, something I've come across a little bit, is almost that PDF, because of the challenge of reading data, or the amount of data in PDFs, there's various tools now which are making it easier and easier to grapple with that and start to do that. So there's uh, PDF tables by, I think they're called the Sensible Software Company, the uh, Scraper Wiki, up in Liverpool. And I'm sure there's various more like that of almost, how do we build a tool so we all of us keep firing PDFs at it and we can gradually learn all the variations in PDFs so we can learn how to get data out. I think there's a, little, there's a nice sort of thing there over the next few years. Um, just, it's interesting what you're saying about half-life of buildings. Yeah, idea pops into my head about how do you measure, just when you build in an error, a margin for error on the data, how do you measure where the cat actually lives? So, for example, if anyone knows about cats, Larry may be officially at number 10, yeah. but being a cat, he'll be popping into a number 11 for a little sneaky snack now and again. <laughs> so it raises all sorts of corruption issues, and <laughs> who is really working for which department? That's very important. Uh, there's a, a thing there as well, I've actually, I mean, if anyone who's been in the Whitehall area as well and looked in some of those cafes of people meeting in the cafes, maybe Larry and Palmerston are in there, mm. plotting against their masters. The, it's, yeah, but I think that comes into that location thing. So that's where I started to think about it as being the cat's job. The, the job they were employed to do rather than the job they were necessarily doing. And maybe we could have built something around it. I mean, there is a, there's a Twitter account called I Spy MP, where people can spot MPs and report things. Maybe we could have actually had some crowdsourced spotting of cats to work out what they're really up to and what they're really doing. But maybe that's a, a future thing to think about. 
But then, we, yeah, cat identity issues as well. Then oh, it's going to get very tricky. I'll think about that. Um, actually, you just touched on it. In that, um, the real purpose of having a cat, I thought, was to keep the mice down. So um, you haven't yet tagged in the success rate at doing that. Perhaps like a leak table. Yeah, I couldn't find any data about their captures. The I was worried about getting some sense of area by capturing data about kills by government. It seems a bit. Might, again, it might gain some security issues. I might find myself barred from some rooms, the in certain departments, more barred than I already am. The, but yes, I, mean, I think there is a thing, though, of you know, are these cats actually, is their job to catch mice or is their job to, to appear in photos and get strokes a bit? You know, I don't think there's actually, I haven't seen the job description. So maybe we should be maybe we should be FOI in government for a job description. That might be an interesting place to start on that. Then we could focus on that. are we getting the right outcomes based on that. Okay. Oh, um, <laughs> okay, I think um, we'll have to wrap it up because it's ten to but thank you so much, Peter, for a really enjoyable lecture. As Peter mentioned, neatly followed from this, we next week have uh, Paul Downey from Government Digital Service in to talk about uh, the characteristics a register needs to uh, feature on register.gov.uk, and he'll be taking a few registers through the official register design authority process. So come along if you can. Thank you. <laughs>